Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's news conference with members of the Expedition 23 crew. Expedition 23 begins with the Soyuz TMA-16 undocking in March. These three new crew members will arrive shortly thereafter on a Soyuz TMA-18. Their launch is currently scheduled for April 2nd. With that, we'll begin with NASA astronaut Tracy Caldwell Dyson, who will serve as the flight engineer for this long duration mission. Tracy was born in Arcadia, California and holds degrees from California State University at Fullerton and University of California at Davis. She was selected by NASA in 1998 and has served numerous technical roles before her first mission. She flew as a mission specialist on STS-118 in August 2007. Among her tasks for that mission, Tracy served as MS-1, assisting the flight direct flight deck operations and performed robotic arm operations and also served as the intravehicular crew member directing the mission's four spacewalks. Tracy accumulated more than 12 days of spaceflight experiment experience. Tracy, we'll turn it over to you now to introduce your crew members. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks all for being here. It's indeed our pleasure to tell you about our mission and to answer any questions that you have. I'll start with uh, introducing ourselves and then uh, give you a brief overview describing the, our mission. To my right is uh, our Soyuz commander sitting in the center seat. This is Alexander Skvortsov. He's a colonel in the Russian Air Force. He has over 800 hours in high-performance aircraft, including MiG-23 and Su-27. And he is also uh, a cosmonaut selected in the year of 1997. This will be his first space flight. And to his right is Mikhail Kornienko. And he, is, uh, he has a bit of an eclectic background, ranging from paratrooper to uh, an actual rocket scientist. He was uh, working to develop and test hardware related to EVAs on Mir and, uh, before being selected as a cosmonaut in 1998. This will also be his first mission to space. So I'll turn it to, to them to say a few words. Sasha. Ну и рад вас приветствовать. Спасибо большое за то, что пригласили на конференцию. И надеюсь, что она пройдет сегодня в хорошем деловом таком и дружественном настроении. I'm happy to greet you all here, and um, I want to thank you for um, inviting me to this press conference. I think that this will be a very good event, and we'll have a very good discussion today. Михаил. Хотел также поблагодарить вас за приглашение. Я думаю, что у нас будет интересный разговор. Я в этом уверен. Мы ждем ваших вопросов. Yes, I would also um, thank everybody for coming here today, and I think that we will have a very good discussion. I'll be very happy to answer any questions that you may have. And as Nicole said, I'm Tracy Caldwell Dyson. I'll be uh, accompanying them in the Soyuz uh, in the right seat and uh, looking forward to this mission. Uh, we have highlights um, of our mission, uh, mainly focusing around vehicle traffic. During our mission, we'll see progress shuttles and Soyuz. Uh, we will have both a US, seg a U.S. stage EVA as well as a Russian stage EVA and a whole host of science experiments and ISS maintenance to perform. Our increment spans the months between April through September, starting with our launch April 2nd from Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. We'll dock to the space station two days later to join the Expedition 23 crew, commanded by Oleg Kotov, TJ Kramer, and Suichi Noguchi. Not long uh, after we arrive and get settled in, we will undock Progress 35 to make way for Progress 37 to launch and dock in its place, carrying with it many supplies that we will spend uh, hours uh, transferring and putting in their place. The month of May is also going to be quite busy for us. Again, uh, Progress 36 will be undocking, and this is in preparation for uh, opening up ports on uh, the space station uh, for new modules to arrive. The 21S crew, Oleg and his crew, will relocate their Soyuz uh, shortly after that from the FGB to the aft end of the SM, and that is in preparation for the module that the shuttle crew will be bringing up, the Russian mini research module one named Rasviet. Shortly after, the, uh, shortly after that relocation, the crew of STS-132 ULF-4, commanded by Ken Ham, will be arriving, and their crew in their payload bay will be bringing this Russian module, the MRM-1. They'll be using the robotic arm to uh, take it out of the payload bay and attach it uh, in place to the FGB. 
And they also will be bringing up a number of spare parts, batteries, as well as uh, antennas uh, in their payload bay, and also equipment uh, related to uh, our stage EVAs um, to uh, assist us. They will stay docked for about eight days, and, uh, and we will wave goodbye to them uh, towards the end of May. And at that time, our crewmates from Expedition 23 will uh, be prepared to come home. Oleg Kotov will then be handing over the command of the space station to Alexander, and that will mark the end of Expedition 23 and the start of Expedition 24 as they ingress their Soyuz, undock, and come home. The first two weeks of June we will spend as a three-person crew uh, starting off Expedition 24 with Alexander in command of the space station. Mid-month June, the crew of 23, Soyuz 23, which will be commanded by Fyodor Yurchikin. And in the center seat, left seat will be Shannon Walker and Doug Wheelock uh, will be in the right seat. And they will come join us uh, on the 16th to become part of Expedition 24. Shortly after they arrive, after we give them a few weeks of adaptation, uh, we'll put them back into their Soyuz and they will relocate from the SM aft to the MRM-1 port and be the first to dock uh, on that port. And then shortly thereafter, toward the end of that month, we will then uh, launch Progress 38 and again with new supplies that will keep us busy with uh, transfer during those couple of weeks following the, the docking. The month of July is a rather exciting time for us as uh, increment crew as we look forward to both our U.S. segment EVA number 15 and our Russian segment EVA uh, number 25. The, con the main task of our U.S. EVA will be to install a PDGF, which is a grapple fixture for the robotic arm that will be installed on the top uh, port side of the FGB module, and that's for future robotic missions. The content of the Russian EVA will be uh, one of the main tasks will be centered around installing cables for the new MRM module. And if there's any questions related to that, our um, spacewalker Michal uh, will be able to answer that. Spacewalkers for the U.S. EVA will be Doug Wheelock and myself and will be supported uh, on orbit as IV Shannon Walker and from MCC Oscar Kaler. On the Russian segment, EVA will have Mikhail Korninko and also Fyodor Yurchikin as our spacewalkers. Rounding the end of July, we will see our second shuttle uh, guests arrive, STS-134 ULF-6, commanded by Mark Kelly. They'll be bringing with them a pallet full of spares as well, uh, ranging from high-pressure gas tanks to MMOD shields, as well as a, a few S-band antennas. But probably the most high-profile payload will be the AMS, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer they'll use to um, that uh, many scientists are involved uh, to detect cosmic rays in deep space. We'll have about a, a, a quiet period as far as vehicle traffic goes uh, after that for about a month until um, uh, the later part of August. And during that time, as well as all of the months uh, um, that we will be on station, we'll be busy, of course, doing, uh, utilizing the space station for the science it was designed. And, um, but I'm sure during that period of quiescence uh, from vehicle traffic that we will be uh, full force as a six-person crew uh, involved in science and be able to focus on that. Towards the end of August, we will undock Progress 38 to make room for our new Progress 39 that will launch shortly after that in dock. And by mid-September, we will uh, be packing up our things and uh, ingressing our Soyuz uh, Sasha Alexander will be handing over command of the space station then to Doug Wheelock, who will become the commander of Expedition 25. And uh, the undock of our Soyuz will mark the beginning of that expedition and uh, the conclusion of our increment 23-24. We will, uh, our scheduled uh, date of departure uh, currently coincides with the last, uh, with the launch of the final shuttle mission, STS-133 ULF-5. And that, in a nutshell, is our increment 23-24. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. That's a great overview. With that, we'll start questions here from the briefing room. If you'll just indicate if you have a question, we'll start on this side. Please state your name and affiliation. Uh, Jim Oberg with NBC News. I'm pretty up. And uh, I want to ask all three of you to describe that in your training in the past, few, in the past year 
You know, Garen Kozlov Training Center in Moscow has switched to civilian control and left a lot of military uh, support. How has the change in the uh, management and the resources at the Gagarin Center affected your training, and how how how, how, how do you see them recovering and recovering their, their their quality, which they they're maintaining? But how, but how did that affect your training, if at all, the change in the leadership and change in the in the funding of the Gagarin uh, uh, Cos uh, Cosmos Training Center? E uh, each of you, please. Uh, well, I'll start. Um, they'll probably be able to give you a, um, a more in-depth answer than myself since this transition took place uh, at a time where I, I had fewer trips left. Uh, when I come, when I leave here to uh, join my crew in, in Moscow for the uh, final stages of our training and, and uh, certification, I'll probably have a better idea of, of the change. But uh, from what we can tell, mostly it affects our schedule as, as with any organization when you uh, change leadership. There's uh, a lot of um, uh, turnover, there's a lot of uh, uh, dust to be cleared as they're uh, trying to reorganize themselves and as such I think it uh, mostly affects us in terms of our schedule, availability of instructors um, as well as understanding the new process. Uh, so maybe just a few delays, um, but I can tell you that the, uh, the staff of instructors there are just as dedicated um, through this whole transition period as they were before it, from my perspective. Ну, я здесь полностью согласен, потому что вы понимаете, что в таком переходном процессе обязательно могут быть какие-то, конечно, потери, но наше руководство постаралось сделать эти потери минимальными именно в смысле подготовки в смысле подготовки экипажей, которые непосредственно на данный момент стояли, так сказать, на, на, ближайшее, на ближайшее время. I will have to agree completely. Um, the transition period always means certain losses, but um, I feel that our management has been very diligent and they've been working very hard to make sure that the losses that we do experience are a minimum, and uh, especially where it concerns the crews that are at the end of their training cycle and who are ready to fly shortly. I was the 21st expedition, Maxim Suraev который стартовал 30 сентября. Ну и вы видите, как экипаж работает на орбите. Джефф Уильямс, Максим Сураев никаких проблем не испытывают. Даже у нас слетал еще и клоун вот. вместе с этим, с этим экипажем. Я думаю, что по ним уже можно судить, что качество подготовки экипажа сохранилось. I was a, the, um, a member of the backup crew for the expedition that is currently on board. This guy is launched on September 30th, Max Sarayev, Jeff Williams. And you can see how well they're working together in space. So you can see that it virt uh, has virtually not affected their work uh, whatsoever. So I expect that this will not have any impact on our training as well. Я почему именно обратил внимание на этот экипаж, потому что это был первый экипаж, который выполнял старт уже под руководством нового, новой организации. Хотя наша организация, я думаю, что как она была, центр подготовки космонавтов, так она остается. The reason I bring up this particular crew is because this was the first crew that uh, flew in orbit after the reorganization of um, our organization. Uh, but um, I just want to emphasize that uh, we have always been the center for cosmonaut training, and we will uh, remain the cosmonaut training center. Extra question. You'll be the first time with three Russian cosmonauts on the expedition crew, I believe. Uh, so who does not get to sleep in the service module? We уже сейчас обсуждаем этот вопрос, он достаточно насущный. Вот. Ну, первые наши, так сказать, какие-то предложения есть и со стороны Олега Котова, Максима Сураева, вот, Федора Юрчихина. 
недалеко вчера мы думали над этим. Я думаю, что место будет. I have to say that this is a rather pressing concern for us, and we have been discussing this relevant issue with um, Oleg and with uh, Maxim. And actually, yesterday we spoke to a Fedor Yurchik, and he gave us some tips as well. But I'm pretty sure that we'll find room for everyone. Раз мы отправляем шесть человек на станцию, то я думаю, что мы как-то придумаем, где им можно отдыхать. Because we're planning to have six crew members on board, I'm pretty sure we'll find a place for everyone where they can rest and relax. Next question. I think a question for Tracy. Uh, not that you don't have enough things coming and going, but I think during the, your stay you also, um, while it won't come near the ISS, there might be one or two Falcon 9 launches as dem a demonstration flights. And, on one of their update, one of SpaceX's updates, they showed you visiting um, their facility. Um, do you have any uh, any tasks or um, or uh, responsibilities on board the ISS to prepare for the future arrival of commercial cargo transfer vehicles, such as Falcon 9 and Dra Dragon? Yeah, the way the crews mainly interface with these vehicles are through, first of all, the ones that involve grappling. Um, as robotic operators, uh, we're responsible for um, attaching the, uh, to, to the vehicle and then attaching that vehicle to the space station. So as robotic operators, we're trained uh, generically to do that, but then um, also when, we, when it comes close to uh, <clears throat> determining when that vehicle will appear in an increment, we get more specific about the vehicle and the, the nuances of, of that vehicle in, in, in terms of grappling to it. But certainly all of us learn how to, uh, once the, do the vehicle is docked to the space station, all of the mechanisms involving the hatch work, all of us learn to uh, the specifics of, of that, as well as entering the vehicle. Sometimes the vehicle will have a different layout in terms of stowage and, uh, and rack locations, and so we'll learn specifically uh, those details um, in visiting those sites. And, and uh, as, as, the as the time frame uh, gets a little bit more uh, concise and clear as to when those vehicles will appear, crews will make visits to those uh, sites to learn the details. Uh, we all learn pretty generically how to, how to operate hatches, but sometimes there's some some differences, some nuances that uh, we need to go see in person. And um, you also mentioned uh, the arrival of the uh, alpha magnetic spectrometer during your stay. Um, does that go into service while you're there, or is it just installed? And if it does, um, are, is, are you the point person, or is there someone else on the, on the Expedition 24 crew that's the point person for, uh, for seeing it come online, I guess? Well, I'd certainly like to pass the buck on to the 24 crew because I, I don't know much about the uh, spectrometer myself. What I do know is that it's, it's going to be coming up and installed during that shuttle mission. And um, exactly when it gets checked out and, and actually utilized, uh, I, haven't, I haven't had any training on it and uh, do not know at this time. So. Okay, next question. Uh, Mary Ann Dyson with National Space Society. A question for Tracy Caldwell Dyson, no relation. Um, I'm wondering which uh, science experiment you're most looking forward to doing. I noticed you have your background in chemistry. Is there a particular experiment that you're excited about? Well, uh, gosh, I, you know, there's not one particular experiment um, that I can I can identify right now because. As a crew member in training, I'm, I'm studying these things more than I am doing them. And if you'd stay tuned and ask me that question uh, more towards the middle of my increment, I bet I'll have a better answer for you. But I can tell you as a, as a chemist and a scientist by background, uh, I am looking forward to um, as something that uh, as, a, as a researcher myself, uh, um, I never, I, you know, I, I, I enjoyed, what I enjoyed the most about being a researcher was actually being in the lab and getting my, my hands on the uh, equipment and actually uh, uh, creating the science from that standpoint. And so that part I will definitely enjoy, um, especially the, the physical science-based experiments, the biological-based, um, biological science experiments. 
the, the principal investigators, though, of all these experiments are the ones that are really the, the brains behind developing them and, and the, the brains behind interpreting the data that's received. And so I am more, uh, for them, a, a wrench monkey to, to uh, get their experiment put in place, and they're the ones that actually run it. Uh, but I am looking forward to, uh, uh, to setting those things up and to getting, the, getting everything just right so that they can get the data that they need, because I know firsthand how much work went into uh, getting those prepared and uh, all the work that it took to get the time to get the data out of it. So I'm looking forward to it from that standpoint, just about every experiment. And then there's also experiments where I'm actually the subject. And uh, in those, um, I'm looking forward to the aspect of, of performing these experiments that in ways that I've, I mean, I've never had to, uh, you know, for instance, uh, image my own heart or take my own blood, and I'm hoping that uh, uh, the way I've been trained, I've been trained very well that uh, once I get on orbit and try to transfer those skills to microgravity that uh, I'll be able to uh, get them the data that they need, they, they need and that they're looking forward to. So I hope that you'll stay tuned and ask questions more towards the middle of my increment when I actually have some experience with uh, working with them. All right, next question. Jill Tolk with Bay Area Houston Magazine. I have two questions, so Tracy, I'll start with you. I noticed that one of the first technical assignments you had after being selected as an astronaut was as a Russian crusader. You've flown on a shuttle, had a great adventure, of course, and now you have the experience of flying in, on Soyuz on station. So does any of your, how, how does your background and experience thus far help translate to station and the experience and people you've met? Wow, well, it's hard to put that answer in a nutshell, and uh, you've uh, kind of encapsulated pretty well all of the, all of the training I've had uh, to prepare me for this mission uh, for increment 23-24. That yes, indeed, I, as a, a new astronaut, I spent a significant amount of time in Russia, mainly in Moscow, working at Energia, but as well at, at GCTC interfacing with all of the hardware, software, and schematics that we would use as crew members on orbit to make sure that those, those products, if you will, were going to be uh, in the right you know, training language uh, for the crew so that uh, um, what they saw in orbit was what they have been training with here on the ground. So I have, I've had a, a lot of exposure to the space station modules from the inside to the outside from the very beginning. Uh, before we ever launched the FGB, I was learning about it. So I think that that has uh, served me well in preparation for this flight so that I could concentrate on all of the, uh, the, the larger aspects. Um, you know, the, the, the station is so voluminous. It's even, I think, twice as big as it was when I visited as a, a shuttle crew member. So there's just a tremendous amount of information to know, and I'm I'm very grateful for the experience I've had since I got here, that it feels almost like a head start in terms of preparing for this particular mission. Uh, the, uh, from, from that to even the, the period of time I spent as a Capcom in MCC has also been invaluable to preparing for this mission. Because on a shuttle mission, it's a very fast-paced life, and we spend every single day going at full throttle. And on the space station, as you all know, it's a much more uh, relaxed pace, a sustained pace, where you live where you work and you work where you live. And you, the relationship that you develop with your team in MCC uh, really affects very much uh, the, um, the outcome of your mission, both professionally and personally. And having had that experience of being a Capcom, sitting on the MCC side of the team, has prepared me for interacting with them when I'm on orbit and uh, being prepared for, for the way that, that uh, operations are uh, performed here on the ground in order to help us do the job we need to do in orbit. So I think I've learned a lot of patience. I've learned a lot of uh, background information about the, uh, um, the, the, the station itself all before I entered the training for this particular mission. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Well, thank you. My other question is for Alexander and Mikhail. It 
is a good thing that you're going to station. You'll have a lot of good work. But what sort of things are you looking forward to that relate to art and culture that you can share your experience with family and friends and coworkers back in Russia? У нас есть программа обучения со станции. Мы общаемся со школьниками по хэм радио непосредственные трансляции через каналы связи. То есть мы видим друг друга со школьниками. Если вы имели в виду этот аспект, то он на станции присутствует и достаточно часто. Well, if your question relates to the uh, educational program, um then we do have a program where we communicate with school children and with students on the ground um, using ham radio and our regular nominal voice channels as well. Okay. So, oh, go ahead. I can add something to the experience. Maybe we've been waiting for this flight with Mikhail for a long time. Вот. Я думаю, у нас сейчас уже за ну, практически 12,5 лет шли к этому полету. Осталось, надеемся, немного. Вот. Я думаю, что какой-то опыт мы приобретем во время этого полета, и мы постараемся мы поделиться с теми людьми, кто будет заинтересован. In terms of the general experience, um, Mikhail and I have been in training for a long time, actually. We've been, um going towards uh, our goal for the past 12 and a half years, and hopefully there isn't much time left for us to continue striving for our goal to um, be finally in space. So that time allowed us um, to accumulate a lot of interesting experience, and in terms of education, as well as art and culture, we'll be happy to share this experience with um, anyone who's interested. Did Mikhail, did you want to respond? No. Okay. Our next question, Robert. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com again. Uh, sort of working off of that, um, given that it has been 12 years uh, to get to space, um, what are uh, what are both uh, of, um, both of you looking forward to um, the most during the stay? And then for all of you, uh, with such a busy um, uh, increment, what presents the largest challenge uh, amongst all the activities uh, that you think will present the, the biggest challenge at this point. Ну, эта работа, как правильно сказала Трейси, она может быть не так быстро и не так сильно насыщена событиями, как программа полет шаттла. То есть это будет достаточно рутинная работа. Вот. Но сами понимаете, что приятно было даже как-то слушать Трейси, когда она очень коротко прочитала и сказала о нашей программе. Well, as uh, Tracy pointed out very correctly, the, our flight schedule, um, our timeline on board will not be as busy as the one for the shuttle crew. Uh, it will be more routine work, but even so, when you look at it, when I was listening to um, Tracy's opening statement, it was very nice to hear a very concise description of all the activities and all the events that we will have uh, on board while we're there. Yeah. Начинаешь понимать, сколько предстоит, как бы уже знаешь, но вот сейчас, именно услышав, осознаешь даже на вот этой пресс-конференции, что работа будет очень напряженная. Вот. И какие-то, то есть и очень ответственные. И нам самая главная задача выполнить все то, что нам поручено. So throughout the course of our training, we do um, realize that there'll be a lot of work uh, that we'll need to do on board and a lot of responsibilities that we'll have to fulfill. But I think during the final stages of preparation, it really brings it home. And even this press conference it makes us think about all the things that we will have to do and all the great responsibility that is placed on us. So even though our schedule on board will be very busy, uh, we'll do our best to um, not let anybody down. Jim over again with NBC. One of the special features of the station that's new, it's all new for you for you guys, but new for Tracy is the cupola. How do you plan on utilizing that extraordinary 
window into the universe? How do you plan on doing it? What advice have people given you of things you can't miss? What do you have to watch? And how long do you think you're going to be sitting there looking out the window? Well, I can tell you just from my first experience in space that uh, it will be difficult to pry me out of that window. I, uh, I think uh, what I'll miss the most about shuttles is the, the spectacular panoramic view we get from the windows in the cockpit that we will not have otherwise in the station if it weren't for this cupola. And that goes a, a long way toward um, the uh, crew morale as well as um, you know, affirmation of, of why we're doing this. And for that reason, I wish everyone could be looking out that cupola. Because what I realized as a crew member on the shuttle and staring out that window and using my free time to do just that, that you, you get such an appreciation for not just what you're doing, but just the, uh, the delicate um, planet that we live on. And, and I don't think there's a single person that could look out that window and see that, that spectacular, unique view of our planet and ever feel the same. And it makes you feel very protective of the environment and the opportunity that we have to observe it from that vantage point. And I can only imagine that with a cupola window, uh, how much more enhanced that will be, especially with the increasing size of our space station and the crew that inhabit it. It will be tremendous. But what that does for everybody uh, is opens up crew observation. I mean, we, we have windows about the, the size of a large plate now and imagine what we can do with uh, several different angles uh, that we can look at the Earth. Not to mention how complex and large our space station is becoming and how difficult now our robotic tasks and our EVAs will become. And that having that window will uh, help aid in all of those tasks, especially those that are going to be on the port side of the space station. It's, um, it's going to be a tremendous uh, um, asset to us, uh, both from a, a, an emotional state, you know, mental well-being, as well as from a um, practical and, and uh, um, operational sense. And um, my commander on the space shuttle mission uh, said to me once I was uh, taking a few minutes to stare out the window and not really sure if that's what I should be doing if I was stealing minutes away from uh, the precious timeline. And he caught me looking out the window and he said, everybody else right now is doing email and sending messages and taking pictures and you're the only smart person got their nose stuck in the window, which affirmed for me that, uh, that you know, you, you could spend all of these years training and all these years sacrificing the time away from your family and, and uh, um, for the cause of improving this uh, space program and carrying on this space station program without taking that moment for yourself uh, to really um, remind you that the sacrifices were all well worth it. Take a picture of your nose smudge on glass. Oh, <laughs> no doubt. That would be a great no doubt. But they, they probably have a much different uh, perspective of uh, this being a, a first opportunity. What are you going to look at? Questions for me? Yes. I, oh, sorry. I agree with Tracy. It's one of the most important elements of the station. It's like a window во Вселенную. Это впервые мы имеем такой элемент в космосе. I agree with Tracy that this is one of the most remarkable elements on board of the station. This will be our sort of window into the universe. Конечно, в первую очередь это как средство управления рукой манипулятором для дальнейшего обслуживания станции. В первую очередь. Of course, um, it's primary um, purpose is uh, to uh, serve as the robotics workstation for our work with the robotic arm. Ну, я стараюсь себе представить, какой вид я могу получить из куполы, и вот сейчас я пока не могу этого представить, насколько это будет грандиозный вид. In my head, I'm trying to imagine what it will be like looking out the cupola window. And it really, for me, it's hard to wrap my mind around it and to see what I will see. 
Это также великолепный инструмент для наблюдения Земли, для фотографирования, для, для съемок Земли. This is also an excellent tool for Earth observations, operations, uh, for photo imagery, for video imagery. Uh, no, not not yet. I'm going to do it. Our next question. It's fresh. Yeah. Uh, Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Uh, sort of, Jim just stole my question about blogging, but uh, sort of work next to that. Um, are any of you going to be tweeting? Um, <laughs> and you will have, uh, if I guess, if TJ gets it up and running live internet. Um, how do you see that affecting your bill, affecting your interaction with the ground? Well, uh, as far as tweeting goes, uh, I don't tweet now, so I don't think I'm going to tweet up in space. Um, I have different outlets for communicating to folks, and uh, what I look forward to the most, uh, it's not electronic by any means, but uh, sort of answers both your questions that, of the cupola, of what I'm going to do and how I'm going to communicate, but I've uh, uh, sent up for myself a set of, um, a, a sketch pad and a set of um, uh, colored watercolor watercolor pencils that I, I hope to be able to recreate the scenes that are still so um, blazoned in my mind of uh, of our uh, earth as well as uh, the horizon with all the stars and so that'll be my form of tweeting uh, and uh, keeping uh, in touch with uh, sharing my experience uh, with uh, those uh, back here at home but as far as the, the live internet uh, and, and how that will affect our interactions with the ground, uh, I think remains to be seen. Again, stay tuned and ask me that question uh, midstream in our, in our increment. But I, I, I don't think anyone, anyone could help, uh, you know, kind of um, being a little self-conscious so when you know you float in front of a camera uh, that uh, is streaming live video down to the internet. If that was placed in your home, you'd, you'd certainly uh, probably you know, uh, straighten up your shoulders before you got in front of it. And, um, but I, you know, at the same time, I think it will be, uh, it'll take some time to adjust to it at first, but I think the, the best part about that is that it is going to uh, open up this, uh, this spectacular uh, um, program that we have to, to, to those who otherwise wouldn't uh, care to learn much about it. It's just another avenue to, to learn, to, to, to teach the, the, the public basically about their space station and their space program and, and invite them inside. So um, I, I, I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to getting used to it uh, uh, since um, uh, I've never had a live video streaming in my home before. <laughs> but uh, I sure hope that it has a positive outcome. Okay, I believe we have uh, time for one last question. Okay. Jill Tolk, Bay Area Houston Magazine. It's a follow-up question for each of you, similar to what we've talked about. Since you're, you'll be on station for five or six months and have time to look out the window, is there any specific part of Earth or of the sky that you all would like to observe over time or just keep your eye on? Um, I'll pass that question on to my crewmates. Наверное, это будет так интересно, что какого-то особого места нету. Я бы хотел смотреть на всю планету. Конечно, есть какие-то предпочтения. Это мой дом, это город, где я родился. Некоторые другие места, скажем, мне очень интересно будет поглядеть на Гору Килиманджаро, куда я в свое время зашел, на город Инков, Мачу-Пикчу в Перу, где я тоже был. Это интересные места, и я, я бы хотел их снять сверху. Well, first of all, I expect that the view will be so um, tremendous, so outstanding that I really don't think that there will be a, a spot in the sky that will be better than others. But there are some points of interest on Earth that I would like to um, see, hopefully. And one of them is, of course, the uh, place where I'm from, my hometown. The Mount of Kilimanjaro, also, I climbed that mount um, a few years ago, and so that would be interesting. Machu Picchu, the ancient city, that is something that I've um, seen in real life. So I would like to see that from space as well. 
Да, в моем предпочтении. Я просто один раз видел выставку нашего космонавта, и он сказал, что иногда появляются такие виды, которые вот только сейчас и в данный момент можно увидеть и сфотографировать. Поэтому я думаю, что в каждом из нас живет человек-художник, поэтому попробуем, может, что-то еще найти такое, чтобы было очень красиво. Again, I expect that the view from space will be very beautiful. Um, I attended an exhibition of a Russian cosmonaut once, and uh, his paintings were very beautiful. And he told me that um, there are still places on Earth that can you can only see from space that are th this day, right now modern day um, cities and uh, more modern day locations. And that is something that always stays with you and brings up an artist within you. Um, you know, I have to agree with both my crewmates uh, that uh, you can just pick any any spot on the planet as well as in the sky, and it's just uh, mesmerizing to say the very least. But um, as I've described before, one of the most uh, unexpected discoveries, and I say I say that um, somewhat uh, with a smirk because none of my colleagues I was so surprised had told me before I launched on the shuttle to expect this. I had been told that when you get above the atmosphere, of course, the stars aren't going to blink like they do down here. But nobody prepared me for uh, seeing the stars in three dimensions, which you don't have the pleasure of down here. Um, but when you're certainly above the atmosphere, you actually see the distance between the stars. You can see that stars are actually closer to you than they are, than others are. And I wasn't quite prepared for that, and I think that uh, nearly hypnotized me uh, in that window. And I can't wait to get back to that and uh, refresh my memory so that when I come back, I can uh, uh, tell that um, with a little bit more freshness to, to, to all those that I share my experience with. So I'm looking forward to that for sure. Thank you. Well, that's a great note to end it on. That will wrap up our briefing. We will have a photo opportunity immediately after the conclusion of that briefing. It'll take place right here in this briefing room. Thank you.